on the wind speeds themselves, uh, if you fly 1.221, the hurricane wind speeds at the site of North Anna are bounded by the tornado wind speeds in the DC. So you can see 140 compared to 330. So for seismic uh, Cat 1 structures, they're designed for both tornado and hurricane winds. And so uh, this this new calculation with the red guy for hurricane winds came up with winds that were less than the tornado, so it was bounded. Okay, next slide. Okay, then looking at the missiles that are generated by this hurricane wind using the red guide 1.221 calculations, we can see in this uh, uh, table here that if you compare the different classes of missiles, uh, that the tornado missile velocities are higher or bound the hurricane missile velocities. And again, this is for consideration of seismic Cat 1 structures. Next slide. Okay, now, when we move to written structures, the bounding changes because we, they're not designed for tornado winds, they're designed for hurricane winds. And so, uh, when you look at the wind speeds just themselves, they're still bounded. So, you see 140 compared to the DCD wind speed of 195. But then, when you get into the missiles, and because they're the way that they're calculated changing, they're not bounded in every case. So, if you see in the bottom table there, that really shows where. The DCD hurricane missile velocities are in the second column. The third column shows the hurricane missile velocities calculated using Red Guide 1.221. And you can see that there's some places that aren't bounded. So uh, the approach then is to say we're committing to taking the most limiting case and making that our standard for the site. So the limiting missile velocities that are used now on the FSAR are uh, on the right hand column. Okay, so next slide. But when, before you, well, I'm fighting. it's on the next slide. I've lost track. It, it just really gets into the departure and the extension. Let, let me, let me ask a more my question. Um, I know what you did, and, and that's fine. That's good. Um, my, my question was, and I, I don't, I'm not sure if I've stumbled over this before, but I, I did here. And I was going to ask the staff about it, but you're up first. I understand that seismic category one structures look at both tornado and hurricane missiles and take the more bounding of the two. Right? You made a statement here, and the staff in the SER echoes it in writing that non-seismic category one structures are designed for hurricane missiles but not tornado missiles so you had to look at hurricane missiles for the written structures because they're not category and when you did that you you discovered that indeed the hurricane hurled automobile was was more energetic than the tornado hurled or, well you didn't look at the tornado hurled automobile right but the, the site specific hurricane wind speed hurled automobile was more energetic than the DCD hurricane hurled wind speed correct automobile if I said that correctly now my my question is What's, what's the basis for saying that I have to look only at hurricane missiles for a non-seismic category one written structure? And, and the thing that came to mind is, suppose I've got this plant in the middle of Kansas, say, where my hurricane wind speeds are probably, oh, close to zero. Does that mean that my written structures do not have to be designed for any missiles whatsoever? Like the fact that in the middle of Kansas. And if that's true, what part of the regulatory guidance allows us to do this? That was going to be my question to the staff. Do you know where that comes from? If you don't, I'll, I, I'll put the staff on the line. I do not know that. Okay, staff, when you come up, question. you're going to get asked this question. Because to me, it sounds kind of strange. Thanks. It, it, sir, I, I'm sure you followed the guidance. I'm not, I'm not questioning, you know, what you did, and, I, and, I, and I'm, you know, and I'm glad you took a look at the site-specific stuff. That's good. That's the whole thing. I'm just really curious about how we walked ourselves collectively, you know, as regulators into this type of situation. <laughs> All right, so um, thank you, 
planning. And so now um, Mike is going to talk, oh, sorry, Mike Arcaro is going to talk about sink injection. Okay, thank you. Mike Arcaro, uh, GEH. Um, this zinc injection, like I said earlier, was uh, uh, elected as an, an optional system by uh, Dominion for North Anna. Uh, it's going to be available at startup to provide a defense in depth with hydrowater chemistry and noble chem. Uh, the zinc injection system continuously injects small amounts of depleted zinc oxide pellets uh, using the uh, feed pumps uh, as a, a driving force. It's a passive system. Uh, the idea is it reduces the occupational exposure to plant personnel by performing a pr protective layer. Uh, it inhibits the uh, soluble cobalt 60 and uh, uh, not so much an issue with uh, ESPWR because of enhancements in materials and the, the lack of the re uh, research piping, but it still uh, would be beneficial because of the under vessel, uh, lower plenum area, and the uh, reactor water cleanup, uh, shut down cooling system piping. So uh, zinc injection system is added for dose rate reductions in the, the North Anna tree plant. Any questions? Okay. Um, thank you, Mike. And now John Dissetway from Dominion is going to talk about the two departures and exemptions we have regarding electrical. John. Good morning. I'm John Dissetway from Dominion. And uh, next slide, Gina. So we have two items this morning to talk about in the switch yard at North Anna. First, the surge protection departure and then the revised switch yard configuration departure and exemption. Next slide, please. So the DCD references Reg Guide 1.204, which provides guidelines for lightning protection for nuclear power plants. And that references four IEEE documents, three of which the North Anna switch yard complies with. The fourth, IEEE C6223 for ap the application guide for surge protection of electric generating plants. There are several recommendations within that that the North Anna Switchyard does not directly comply with. The North Anna Switchyard was designed and constructed in the 1970s to Dominion Electric Transmission Standards. Uh, this predated the issue of IEEE C6223 and Reg Guide 1.204 by about two decades. As a result, the North Anna Switchyard design conforms to most of the requirements given in Reg Guide 1.204, but several of the uh, recommendations given in IEEE 6223 uh, we do not directly comply with. Specific design features of the North Anna Switchyard provide equivalent protection uh, as those recommendations that the uh, Switchyard does, at North Anna does not directly comply with. The result of this is that the offsite power system and Switchyard at North Anna meet the interface requirements given in the DCD and that departure does not affect the DCD design functions or performance characteristics. Next slide, please. All right, for the revised switchyard configuration, the DCD locates the main generator circuit breaker and associated motor operated disconnect switches in a transformer yard that's adjacent to the turbine building. Uh, because of space limitation problems at the North Anna site, these components have been moved to a location we call the intermediate switchyard. There's no change in the electrical connection, the design or configuration of these uh, devices. Therefore, the, the uh, Switchyard design continues to meet the interface requirements in the DCD, and departure does not affect DCD design functions or performance requirements. Next slide, please. In this slide, you can see at the arid location the generator circuit breaker with a motor operated disconnects on either side. This is the DCD configuration, and in the larger uh, drawing for the DCD, that's located in the transformer yard. Next slide. This is the FSAR figure for North Anna, and you can see the same devices in the same electrical location, same configuration, but we put them physically inside a box that we call the intermediate switch yard. This is a physical location change only. Any questions? Yes, many. Good. You, you characterize this as a physical location because of where you've drawn your dotted lines. In fact, it's a functionally different configuration and one that ought to be evaluated in the site-specific PRA, so I'll telegraph that. The functional difference is that you have introduced uh, some, a, a 500 kV circuit breaker, you see there that little box, and you've introduced three single-phase 500 kV to 
230 kV transformers, yes. the intermediate transformer that's shown there. Those do not exist in the certified design. If you go back to the previous slide, you don't see those things there. So that's new. My question is, why did you do that? We did that for uh, the reason that um, the reserve auxiliary transformers and the station auxiliary transformers are to be the same design at North Annie Unit 3. Okay, that's, is that your decision? Yes. Okay, that's your decision. That's not the certified design decision because the certified design specifies no voltages that could conceivably allow different voltage transformers. They have to be the same power rating, but they could yes. be different voltages. That's correct. Okay, so that's your decision yes. to make, to put that transformer in there. Yes, so, um, okay. Now, if I look at this and I look at all of the words that I see, it all it, they all talk about these are space limitations. To me, this is a functionally different electrical configuration. In particular, if I fail any one of those three single phase transformers or that little box circuit breaker there, I lose, without the possibility of recovery, the power supply from my 500 kV transmission switchyard back into the plant, my so-called normal prefer the power supply. I didn't have those failure modes in the certified design because the certified design has that arrow that goes out the top here to normal preferred power supply. So I've added now three trans...